Warning, please be advised that some viewers may find today's episode hard to watch as it touches on the topic of various forms of abuse. Hello dissectors, today we're looking at an asylum with a history so dark, not even a flashlight could help you see through the murkiness without having to look away in horror. Where do these atrocities occur? That would be Penhurst Asylum, a place many believe to be America's most haunted asylum. In 1903, construction was authorised for a facility originally titled the Eastern Pennsylvania Institution for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic. It was state-funded and meant to be a place that housed and took care of such individuals that were considered unfit to function in normal society. When patients were admitted, they were deemed physically as either being an imbecile or insane. The degradation doesn't end there. You were also classified as healthy or epileptic and dentally as having good, poor or treated teeth. It seems that the state would go to great lengths to rid society of anyone who was thought of as an undesirable and soon immigrants, orphans and criminals were housed here too. By 1913, it was declared that any disabled individuals, this includes anyone with physical and mental disability, including those who were mute, deaf or blind, were considered a menace to the peace and unfit for citizenship. It was requested that such people be put into custodial care by the government. Reasons also listed were to keep them from reproducing and safety of others. With poor funding and terrible living conditions, the facility had to house even more people. By the 1960s, about 2,791 people were living there, which was approximately 900 more than maximum capacity. Even though it was classed as a school, it was a huge joke. They only had about 11 teaching staff and none of these had any special education training. With no one really taking much notice of what was going on inside the walls and staff left to do seemingly whatever they wanted, serious cases of bullying, rape and abuse along with what was described as accidental deaths and suicides occurred. People generally though didn't understand what was going on inside Penhurst. Residents were threatened with severe punishments if they so much as uttered a word about their treatments inside to visiting family. And these punishments included moving to a punishment ward, a severe beating with a broom, and even cleaning up excrement. But in 1968, conditions were finally exposed after a local news station called NBC10 decided to run a five-part miniseries on the place. A young reporter named Bill Baldini filmed the segment titled Suffer the Little Children and was left appalled, not just by what he saw, but also by the words of the resident doctor. There were images captured of people, adult people, chained in cribs, covered in their own bodily waste, and children in cages. When interviewing Dr. Jesse Fear, and if ever a surname was fitting, it was his, Baldini was shocked by the callous responses given. You see, Dr. Fear boasted of treating patients harshly for their own good. He said he would lock them away with patients who had severe mental disabilities. And get this, his reasoning was to downgrade them a little, to offend their dignity, as if be being treated like less than human was not already punishment enough. But he did admit that this punishment was not always effective. Dr. Fear commented, what we're trying to do is degrade him to a certain extent amongst his fellows here. They make fun of him then for a while afterwards. But I don't think there's anything inhumane about it or anything if that's the word. I mean, is this guy serious? And this is a man in charge of looking after people's loved ones. It's crazy that he would even think bullying was okay. Another thing that Baldini witnessed with Dr. Fear was his treatment of a patient called Ernie, who had given another resident a welt on the back of their heads. Ernie was threatened by Dr. Fear by saying, you touch one of my boys again, and I am personally going to take care of you myself. Ernie became afraid and told him not to touch him, which seemed to get the doctor off in some way, as his cold response then was, well, before this day is out, you're going to find out what I can do to you. Sadly, at this point, he turned to a member of staff and asked them to put together an injection of the most painful medicine they could find that would not cause damage. Dr. Fear injected Ernie with this and then joked that he really hit the ceiling over that. It sounds to me like Dr. Fear should have gone to prison for his disgusting treatment of his patients. Baldini 
also stated that Penhurst smelt like a doghouse, stating, it just smells like faeces. Rats crawling, roaches crawling all over, faeces and pee on the floor and flies coming in the window. Now, cruel punishments were an everyday occurrence though, as overworked staff would drug patients who seemed to be acting out or chain them to their beds. Some poor residents were even isolated for such long periods of time that they lost their will to speak, fight, and even live. Like most people, if your needs are ignored or you feel abandoned, a common action can be to act out. When patients at Penhurst lashed out by biting, they were initially given a warning, but if they did it again, all their teeth would be pulled while strapped to a rusty dentist chair. In the time that the asylum was in operation, thousands of teeth were pulled out and the chair can still be found in the tunnels beneath the complex. But then on May 30th, 1974, a class action lawsuit was filed against Penhurst Asylum after family members visiting a resident found them covered in bruises. During the trial, it came up about the type of punishment used, which violated both the 8th and 14th Amendments. Things got even worse for Penhurst when in 1983, nine members of staff were indicted on charges ranging from assaulting patients to forcing patients to injure each other. I assume that this was for their own entertainment, as why else do anything so horrific? Worth noting is that some of these victims were in wheelchairs too. Now, while Penhurst was still in operation, many people had unanswered questions about what happened to their loved ones inside. The Penhurst Memorial and Preservation Alliance site is dedicated to hearing the stories of past residents. For the purpose of this episode, I will keep the names of the families to myself for privacy reasons, but I will give you an idea of some of the posts. One young boy was admitted to Penhurst aged about five years old. When he died at 14, his death certificate labelled him an idiot when really he was born with water on the brain. His cause of death was apparently bronchopneumonia, likely brought about from ice baths and other mistreatments. Another young boy came to the asylum in 1952, aged eight years old, said to have a mental disability, but otherwise healthy. For some reason, he only lasted six days. His death certificate signed by a Penhurst physician claimed the boy died from cardiac problems and mental deficiency. So can you imagine the shock from his family when they recovered his body and found it to be completely covered in bruises? In 1980, a young woman died aged 35 years old. Not only was she heavily abused, she had bed sores, her teeth had been ripped out and had been kept in isolation for 24 hours a day. The hospital appeared to claim that the young woman died from eating cake while unsupervised. There are so many reports of people dying inside Penhurst and the families, even to this day, having no clue what happened, like a mass cover-up. And lastly, Roland Johnson, who was a former resident, wrote an autobiography in which he states that in 1958, when he moved into Penhurst, he witnessed a boy being thrown out of a window. This happened when the attendants were changing over for their shifts, and so not paying the proper attention that they should have been. The boy miraculously lived, with his injuries being a broken hip and leg. After all these allegations and findings, the facility was finally forced to shut and closed its doors on December 9th, 1987, leaving behind buildings and underground tunnels that are still haunted by the evidence of the past in the form of residents that are eternally trapped to haunt the darkness within. Caretakers of the asylum have had many ghostly experiences, leading them to believe that the entities trapped in the underground tunnels are angry patients embittered from years of neglect. Like many haunted properties, it has drawn the attention of paranormal investigators. One six foot three male visitor to the property had an encounter with the paranormal which left him needing to hold the hand of the tour guide. He apparently became alarmed when he felt a pressure gripping his neck and from the shadows, a ghost running at him in an attempt to strangle him. Visitors have also experienced assaults from shoving and scratching that have not only left them shaken, but with physical marks that have lasted hours after. There have been many documented accounts of the supernatural from pictures, videos, and electronic voice phenomena, also called EVP for short. Now, answers picked up at Penhurst are not cheerful greetings. They range from go away to we're upset, and disturbingly, I'll kill you. 
There are many electromagnetic frequency spikes recorded throughout the building too, even though no power is currently being provided. While exploring the asylum and its many rooms and corridors, which show signs of trauma and decay, guests have heard slamming doors and footsteps echoing down hallways from a disembodied figure. Worse still is that the sound of sobbing and vomiting can also be heard, like a moment trapped in time of the horrific treatment endured here. When the sounds are investigated, all people find is empty rooms. One of these ghosts is said to be a little girl who roams the many buildings. She's described as having long dark hair with a hunchback and arms that hang by their sides, like she has no energy to lift them. People have also said that in the Quaker building, numerous dark shadows will appear before you, looming at you, and then just as suddenly disappear. It's almost like they're checking you out, maybe to see who you are, and that you mean them no threat. But also in this area, items will either move on their own or be thrown across the room. But it would seem that the ghostly residents are not alone, as guests have also described a nurse wearing an old-fashioned uniform still going about her duties. A medium also believes that there is something demonic in the asylum. What do you think? Do you believe a soul may have twisted enough over time to have become demonic? Let me know in the comments below. Today the asylum takes full advantage of its ghostly tales as since 2010 one building has reopened as the Penhurst Asylum Haunted House. This has brought up many mixed feelings and sure, the haunted house will bring in money and help in restoration plans, but is it being respectful of all those that were abused and lost their lives in the most horrible conditions? My opinion is that it really isn't fair and surely opening up the properties more to paranormal researchers could earn them money without disrespecting the memories of those long gone and others still linger.